Hello everybody and welcome to Storytelling, Philosophy and Reception. Today we're, we're, we are welcoming Claudia Sansoni from the Department of Comparative Lit in University of Chicago. Let's give him a warm welcome. Hey, how are you doing? Very, how are you? I am good. I am in sunny California and you're now uh, in Rome at the moment. Yeah, very hot Rome. Today um, we're going to be talking about mostly whatever it is that comes to mind but we're going to start with the Iliad <laughs> because I've been doing Iliad a day and uh, the Iliad. Iliad Odyssey you said that you probably prefer the Odyssey to the Iliad okay so let's start with why Claudio why would you say this <laughs> well um to be clear there's no 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 hatred towards uh, Iliad or um Iliad lovers, or prefer people who prefer the Iliad. Um, I think I prefer the Odyssey because it allows me to uh, think more about the things that I'm interested in uh, in ancient poetry. So it's a very sort of selfish preference, not a, a statement about the uh, quality of the work or the uh, momentousness of the uh, of the verse. Um, but I do think that maybe the uh, I like that you picked the sea as a sort of starting point because it does maybe um, raise some questions for why I prefer the Odyssey and I do prefer that I do enjoy the sort of um, dislocation the geographic dislocation of the narrative uh, a great deal uh, in the Odyssey and the sort of um, poetic devices that are employed to describe that and then to um, account for differences in narrator perspective. Uh, when we're in different places and, and things like that. So that's the thing I really love about the Odyssey that um, is there in the Iliad, but to a lesser extent, maybe. When it comes to the different perspectives, are you thinking um, of the dialogue sometimes that happens when the, like, when the sailors are saying, should we trust this guy? Um, yeah. No, I mean, that's... Uh, I definitely think the internal uh, um, internal narrators of the Odyssey are, are, are extremely interesting and, and then the uh, character speeches uh, also um, but maybe more more about whether we as an audience trust this guy you know he's telling us a story he's telling the Phaeacians right the story of his uh, travels for a great deal of the text and um, and there's lots of reasons why maybe we don't want to trust uh, the story that he's telling and um, sometimes because he, he tells the same story twice in very different ways um, and then again, that is that is also a feature of uh, some parts of the Iliad, I guess. Tell me about that. What are what are some versions that are different that that really stood out to you? Some versions of, of stories in in the Iliad. Yeah, in the Odyssey, when when Odysseus, you know, oh. changed it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, if we look at the um, uh, the Sirens episode, for instance. Um, a lot of people have a pretty clear memory of, of how that plays itself out, right? The boat comes by, they're singing, he gets tied down and he says, no, don't untie me. But actually it gets narrated over, depending on how you count, four or five uh, discrete chunks of text that have big gaps between them. Um, and I did this exercise in, uh, in my dissertation and in some of my other work, just sort of saying, well, what happens if we like treat them as individual mini stories and look at all the differences? Um, I think one of the most jarring ones that people tend to remember is that in one instance, we hear that it's uh, that they're going to be on an island that's a beautiful meadow. And then in another instance, we hear that the island is covered with the withering bones of the people that the uh, sirens have putatively um, murdered, uh, maybe even eaten. We don't know. Um, so I think we the people have a very fixed idea of how that plays itself out but then when you go back to the text and actually say well what what does the text actually say um it's not so clear and it's really uh, exciting and it's also frustrating and makes you think okay maybe the strategy of having Odysseus tell us first what other people said to him like Odysseus tells the Phaeacians what Circe said to him well can we trust that he's representing Circe right um can we trust that he's representing himself right when, when he says this is what I said to my men um, and then uh, all those kinds of layers are, are really exciting to me. And I think one reason that I really like the Odyssey is that it includes so many of these uh, layers. 
off the top of my mind, I'm um, trying to think of narrations within the Iliad where so and so said this to this person. Um, since I'm in, uh, I'm still singing <laughs> scroll one <laughs> with Nestor saying, uh, you know, Nestor introduces um, himself to the, to the audience really by saying, um, you know, I, I have, I was listened to by men greater than you, Agamemnon and Achilles. And I mean, to an audience that should be like, really? Who are these great men? And he starts naming people that I, some I've heard of and some I have not heard of. Um, there's apparently a polyphemus that was like really great. And then there's, uh, you know, it, within the same two, three lines, of course there's Theseus, but the fact that he says Theseus was greater than Achilles and Agamemnon, you're like, really? Oh, okay. Huh. There, you already get like, a narrator who like you want to believe him because he's Nestor who is uh, in the third generation finally king but at least sweet sweet voiced or sweet tongued or something like that oh yeah yeah um and uh um and people would listen whenever he'd talk but his his ethos is such that he's like yeah these men greater than you listen to me therefore you should listen to me and you're like and then if if you already have that jarring feeling then by the time phoenix comes in and tells achilles his stories you're like are we supposed to listen to the older men are we supposed to believe everything they say or are we supposed to sit there and mm -hmm. yeah grandpa sure <laughs> you know like how, how are we you know so how the audience receives it the first time is everything right like how yeah no, yeah I think, no the i mean it's a great example of some of the the, the sort of I, I think i'm i would call them something like authenticating or authorizing uh devices that well iliad one and two uh especially are just completely filled with these um and you know when you say like okay uh yeah i was listened to by these great men in the past and you when you give off a, a list of names it's like yeah but how do i know that these are great men or not great men or that really i should pay attention to you i should should i just trust you um you know there's a similar moment in Iliad too when agamemnon gets a scepter and says you know this scepter was in the hands of all these great people all these great kings that came before me and now i have it and it came from zeus originally right zeus told Hephaestus to make it Hephaestus gave it to Hermes and Hermes handed it down, blah, 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 blah. And then if you think about the house of Atreus in a little bit of detail, you're like, well, these people weren't, weren't so great. You know, none of these people really were very great. Um, and so are we supposed to acknowledge that basically the power of speech is to sort of reconstitute history uh, as is necessary? Or are we supposed to maybe question the text and say, oh, well, Maybe I don't want to trust these these king people if this is the kind of lineage they assign themselves. But I think that's one of the big challenges of um, Iliad, Iliad 1 and 2 is, is trying to construct various notions of the authority behind speech. And I mean, the, probably the most famous example, right, is the uh, invocation uh, to the muses, which we could talk about for a long time, I'm sure. Oh, oh, for sure. Speaking of scepters, for instance, that word... Um, I was going to put this up actually on Twitter and ask them, what's up with the stemat, with all these, you know, the, these ribbons on, uh, it's been mentioned a few times, the ribbons that are in the scepter of Chryseis. And I'm like, tell me about these ribbons. Like, where else do ribbons come up that they're super important? And, you know, the ribbons of Apollo, mm. the stemata of, of Apollo, but like, but like, okay. And also each he himself is holding um it, it's a scepter it's a scepter it's a scepter i mean it's the same word it's a golden mm -hmm. scepter yep. it's him by apollo just like there's a scepter given to uh given to you know wait is it to the ancestor of agamemnon or to agamemnon i'd have to reread that, that to his ancestors his ancestor um, right and just hand and handed down although yeah. It is it is an extremely 
confusing thing because Crusade, I don't know much about Crusade's scepter, but that's presumably different to the scepter that the the Greeks have. In theory, each of the Greek kings is described as skeptikoi, like bearing or holding a skept- scepter, skeptical scepter. I think that's why we're getting confused here. Um, but it also seems to be the case that in his position as um, commander-in-chief, if you will, like Memnon scepter is the really important one, or maybe the only one that actually got brought to Troy. I'm not sure on that last detail, but in book one, we also hear from Achilles, I think, who says, you know, this is this scepter is just a stick. Someone, you know, went to the forest and cut down a stick and uh, left a, a tree trunk bare, and then they put some, you know, golden nails on it or whatever, and now it's and now you say that it's it's so important. Um, so even in the <clears throat> passage between book one and two of the Iliad, this uh, I think the same scepter is being described in both situations. Um, or at least that's my, I would argue that um, there's two very different sort of uh, theories of its history and importance uh, being argued over. Um, I, that is interesting to, to mention the ribbons. I hadn't thought about the stemata in, in great detail, but I think, you know, maybe in the context of these slightly different ontologies of scepters, um, there's something we could make it back there. Oh, let's not even bring up a rabbit. Let's not even bring, bring up Rabdos. Uh, mm-hmm. there's, there's the Rabdos of Hermes and the Rabdos of of Kirki, and they're in both times they're Rabdos, they're not scepters, you know. So mm-hmm. they're they're magic wands. Is like that's the closest thing I can, uh, you know, because Kirki the witch with a wand, right? Uh, so, but if she's a witch with a wand, what is Hermes with a wand? If that's going to be a wand. If we're going to translate Rabdos as a wand, well, then poets have a wand and we're magical because mm-hmm. uh, um, shepherds have a Rabdos usually that they're leaning on, right? So, yeah, and you know, that, the whole thing. I don't think we're, I, I've read a few things about this recently, but I, re- I really don't think we're ever going to work out exactly what the hell Hermes is doing with his various sticks. I mean, in the passage I was talking about earlier, he even gets called Anax, uh, king, right? Or well, commonly translated as king. Is, and it's not a very strange title to give to Hermes, but he is holding the stick at that moment, the Skeptron. And so perhaps for a while, he's, he's a sort of transitory Anax on the way from the uh, scepter going from the divine realm into the mortal realm. But yeah, there's a lot of mystery around exactly Hermes' uh, uh, stick-bearing capacities. I found I found the whole uh, scepter thing that Achilles was. Okay, this is the one that he swears on, and you're right. I think it's the same. Gosh darn scepter! Um, are they passing it around like it's a conch from the uh, from Lord of the Flies, where it's like I'm holding the conch now, or I'm holding the scepter, so everybody be quiet. Like I, there's so much going on, mm-hmm. you know, that I I, I think that's it's like, exactly the um. And that's exactly the principle, though. In um, in uh, in book again in book two, when there's the uh, testing of the troops, and uh, you know Agamemnon says, "Well, do you do you want to stay or go home?" And uh, Thersites dares to say, "You know, actually, I think screw this. Let's let's go back home." Um, Odysseus takes the scepter and he says, "Well, you're not you're not holding the scepter, so why did you speak?" And then hits him with it um, to restore order yeah. and. Yeah. So there's this idea that, like, you know, unless you have a scepter, you're not your voice doesn't count in the uh, in the assembly. Here's this this description where Achilles says, um, "By the scepter here that will never again put out leaves or shoots, since it first left a stump in the mountains, etc." And now, yeah, though you're right, the way he describes it, it's like he start he describes it as something that was living and now it's not. And the bronze mm-hmm. has stripped it of leaves and bark. So you get the, the thing like, oh, wow. So this is a thing. It was a living thing. And then they bronzified it, I guess. Well, I, I, I mean, no, I, it's what I, I'm going to not correct you, but I amplify what you're saying just because it's one of my favorite lines in, in the Iliad that like this, I think the bronze is something like the ax that cuts off the, the branch. If that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I was trying to figure this out because you know, having seen like like uh, is it Mandalorian or something? Okay. You know, they take a living thing 
and then they they put um have you watched mandalorian do you know what i'm talking about i have i have i'm trying to remember the okay uh, scene that you're so describing the, the scene is you know you you take a, a branch and and then you make it into a, a the staff weapon thing but when you make it into a staff weapon thing you start putting in metal with it mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i wasn't sure if they were describing a, a scepter that was living and then they put in metal with it or what what the bronze yeah, yeah. was all about. i think both of those things are true actually that they're, they're both true i think it's the bronze cuts it down is the axe that cuts the, the branch off and later in that same passage or, or elsewhere it says that they put in I think golden nails um into the There's into the wood golden yeah. nails in there so mm -hmm. you know i i <sighs> Again, uh, one of those things where we need some experimental archaeologists or experimental whatever craftsmen to try to figure out how to make this uh, in the same way people have, you know, re have, have tried to reconstruct the shield of Achilles and the shield yes. of Aeneas and stuff. I mean, I just like want to see like what what is the process? What's going on here? Um, well, you yeah. know, and I think it's very important that you know the 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 other does the thing is we just we just talked about it where it sort of describes that it's living and now it's it's dead which i think is a very beautiful sort of moment of reflecting on like how the symbols of power come into being with respect to nature say but it also hides from us the specific person right it says the bronze cut it down well presumably someone was holding that axe so someone who May have just been a laborer sent out to get some wood, or it may have been, you know, the the carpenter or the the smith who made the scepter, right? So there's a sort of embodied human agency that's been hidden uh, from us, or is not visible to us in the Iliads and in the first explanation of of how a scepter is made. And in the second explanation, we're told that Hephaestus makes it. Right. So that's quite a, a striking difference. Right. We go from, oh, there's some mortal guy. We don't want really to get to know many details. And then it's like, no, no, no. Zeus ordered Hephaestus to, to do this and he did it. So two very different um, views on what kind of labor can actually produce symbols of power that are efficacious. When uh, Aeneas says his um, lineage and uh, and and that was one of those moments where it's like, so therefore, you know, on on both my father's and my mother's side, I'm more important than you, Achilles. Uh, you know, you have a, you know, in your mother's side, you have a, she's not described as a titan, I think, in that passage, but you know, you have you have that goddess, for, but her father is from the old is from is the old man of the sea. And my mother in the Iliad, Aphrodite, is um, the daughter of Zeus and uh, and Dione, right? Um, and it's and then he and then he goes and traces his whole like Trojan ancestry, and um, and says so, so. Therefore, on my father's side, it's like super important. the The idea of of going back and back and back in time to um, to construct how important you are. You're demonstrating that um, each generation before you was important too, and you are part of this noble um, tradition. So it's like the whole thing with the scepter. Who made the scepter? Um, Hephaestus did. By whose order? By Zeus's order. So this thing, even this thing is is super important that I'm, that I'm holding here. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right when, if it's not, made by Hephaestus it it makes it different so that that narrative of Achilles stripping the importance in that way by by taking away and by instead of describing the scepter as and this scepter that was ordered by Zeus to be made and made by mm -hmm. Hephaestus instead he says and this scepter which is uh and which was a natural object and will will never again grow leaves this is the scepter i'm holding and you're and i did think why is he bringing that up i and i did like when i was like singing it i'm like why is he bringing up that the scepter was once a natural object what because the iliad is so full of symbolism i'm like what is he trying to say why 
even bring up the whole nature thing? It, it's a question. You know, I'm just putting out a question. I don't know yeah. if you thought about it or whatever. No, I mean, that, that, that's a great question. And, you know, it is, I've always uh, thought it was extremely fascinating that in order to, you know, articulate a critique of Agamemnon specifically, what Achilles ends up showing us ends up showing us is um, how we might critique the artifice of of power more broadly, right? And uh, in, in in his case, it's you know it's to attack an individual or at least uh, an individual in, in holding a certain office, but um, it it does reveal this whole set of other things of like that are you know makes us think that our symbols of power and authority are really just sort of like a, a deadening of the vitality of of nature and possibly like the kind of work that humans actually do in the background um that's productive of our social relations and not you know Zeus deciding to tell Hephaestus to give her meat the scepter who then hands it down to someone else you know <laughs> The nature is so prevalent in the Iliad. There's in the opening passage already, you're talking about dogs and birds spoiling, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they don't say eating up the carcasses, but that the bodies are now the spoil for dogs and birds. So many metaphors and similes are comparing people to animals, but there's talk about places and um seasons and just as these animals in the winter in this mm -hmm. place do this like it's specific sometimes um so you know you keep remembering that these men are fighting in a field full of animals or near in the sea and you know uh that can destroy them. So I don't know. So maybe the mention of Achilles with uh, with an object that that people had had ended up making or gods had made, but constructed from something natural, has everything to do with uh, that there that there are forces at, besides gods that there's nature too, you know. Absolutely. No, I am. Um, yeah, I spend a lot of time in my. Uh, and dissertation and then in future book project arguing that there's a sort of um, materialism in the Iliad that is not a you know godless in sort of materialism of like brute forms but like a sort of animate and exciting and um, perhaps more uh, uh, just alternative to this sort of hierarchy, hierarchic world in which the gods are above men and uh, dictate how things should go. Um, so I think that's absolutely right to sort of um, tap into the sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, but um, uh, the vivid sort of nature imagery that reminds us that there's like sort of bigger forces at play. Absolutely. Well, I, someday I'm going to write something about how Homer doesn't seem to like Olympians in general. So <laughs> he seems to he seems to like Titans. I mean, when he talks about uh, you know Thetis is Thetis's son is the hero of of the Iliad. And she's a titan, mm -hmm. and her people and the, the Nereids. And whenever it comes to them, they don't seem to be doing anything bad. But when it comes to the Olympians, they seem to be doing all sorts of bad things. And Apollo, in this tenth year, um, is on the side of the Trojans. I don't know what the heck he was whose side he was on before the tenth year, but on this wonderful tenth year, when we're first hearing about everything. In the Iliad, he is all about the Trojans, and his family, and of, and of course Leto and Artemis, their their temples were in Anatolia, mm -hmm. uh, and Leto. I mean, there's a whole everybody knows the whole story of like how Leto, when she first was arriving that way, <laughs> you know, trying to bear her children supposedly over um, in what is now Greek territories, you know, nobody wanted her. Um, yeah, it, it's just... I, mean, I think it's uh, 
and it's a valuable uh, connection to make also with the sort of uh, Anatolian background to uh, well, whatever's going on in the long lead up to us having a, a text that we call the Iliad and um, discuss and enjoy and, and uh, have our students read. Um, I'm not up, uh, up to date on all the details of this very, very much ongoing debate, but people have connected the orthography of um, early spellings of Apollo to um, Anatolian languages. Um, of the many connections people try to draw between Anatolian languages and Homer, this one is perhaps one of the more convincing. Um, uh, but there's also the fact that we know a, uh, you know, that we have this one uh a tantalizing snippet of a uh, Luvian uh, poetry, um, one line from I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna really guess a date, and then someone can uh, write in the comments of the YouTube video that I'm completely wrong. But something like 1200 BC, um, saying that you know, the, I think it goes, and then they went or they came from um, steep uh, Ilion. Uh, unfortunately, until someone. Uh, finds the rest of the poem for us, uh, we're, we're a bit in the dark, you know? And that's a completely different rabbit hole. I mean, that's, so I, for instance, I'm very fascinated by the Leto On. There's that writing there, and it's, I don't want to describe it as a steli, I'm not sure it's a steli, but it has three different writings. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, Elysian Greek and Aramaic. Yeah. Okay. I just All have right. to look it up because I couldn't remember if it was Lysian or Livian, but yeah. That that's why it, it brought it to mind because you were talking about Livian and I'm like, oh, mm, was that Livian? But it's not. Darn. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were um, talking earlier about you know the very different uh, time period, but uh, uh, texts in uh, you know uh, north uh, northeastern parts of Africa that. Um, are you know in Greek, but then also in on the same stele uh, in uh, Gaeas and uh, or Sabaean, uh, sometimes all three, um, and you know you see a similar sort of um, cosmopolitan interlingual uh, environment in which Greek is just one component, right? And um, because we have so much Greek from uh, the earlier parts of the you know the sort of uh, history of the language and, and literature, we we forget that there must have been uh, corresponding quantities of of material in other languages, and this is sort of for various reasons become uh, more or less invisible. Um, and you know the the question there of the, for instance, the chronological. Uh, horizons matching up for something like Hittite and, and Linear B uh, seem very uh, alluring, but then they end up raising more questions than, than they give us answers for as well. Um, and so we're in a sort of uh, constant spiral with the, with the evidence that's so appealing, but sometimes uh, not giving us the kinds of answers we expect or maybe want. But I think that's a good place to be rather than making up solutions that don't exist to <laughs> uh, linguistic and, and, uh, problems and, and problems of cultural exchange. Um, but it remains, I think, something that can be explored uh, further. And, you know, um, we should we should make an effort to really teach people the, the language as much as we can. This is why comparative literature and archaeological studies are so important and, and why it's uh, got to be interdisciplinary. Uh, when, when you talk about um, about the fall of Troy, if if it happened or not, you were, you're having to deal with archeologists and you're gonna have to deal with Anatolia and its languages if you want any evidence of that uh, ah. to support whether or not these wars took place. You know, I'm still reading through Eric Klein's, um, the revised mm -hmm. 1177 BC and his Trojan War a short introduction to the Trojan War, and I keep having to refer to that to those when I'm um, reading the Iliad, um, not because I think that the Iliad is true, but because it's fun to to see what is known to be true and factual versus Homer's fanfic. 
know? Yeah. No, I, I think that's, uh, I love the Homer's fanfic uh, perspective. The, the research I've been reading up on recently that I've just found really fascinating, correlating sort of uh, trying to see Homer as a kind of, Mm, say uh, Homer in the sixth century BCE. What would it? What it? What would it have felt like? And the, uh, what would the experience have been like? Because it's obviously pointing back into history a great deal, um, and it's imagining that the world was was one way um, in in what we sometimes refer to as Mycenaean times. Um, and then the linear B evidence gives us a very different picture of what society may have looked like. Um, you know, one example is uh, thinking more about the Odyssey. The um, I think this is Barbara Olson's work on what it was like to, uh, you know, ha have a large amount of enslaved people. Um, well, for the Odyssey, that looks like having fifty or so uh, enslaved people in your home, sort of domestic group of um, people, but. Looking at the Linear B evidence, um, especially for uh, enslaved women, it seems that actually palace complex had sort of peripheral centers in which many more than fifty slaves or enslaved people would have been would have been housed and 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 sort of made to work in kind of factory like uh, settings. So there's a sort of peculiar question about what kind of idealized version of like aristocratic life are people reading when they read um, uh, or listen to Homer in the, in the sixth century BC versus what was aristocratic life actually like um, back then. And sort of when you realize that there's a big difference, I think the, the fan fiction element becomes really interesting because it's sort of like a, what kind of, you know, uh, uh, what's the, what, what kind of fake news about the past are you in, uh, enjoying without realizing or if you are enjoying it I imagine a lot of people who I imagine enslaved people listening to the uh, Odyssey in the 6th century weren't enjoying it at all but they were being represented as sort of weird version of their own past too um, so there's a lot to be uh, sort of picked that there I think that's really exciting yeah, remembering that there's, again, going back to what we were saying, there's the oral tradition, stuff from long ago, and writing that is lost, or writing that wasn't interested in writing down narratives, right? Like any linear B that we have, um, they're like, they're, they're not, well, okay, so they're, what do we have? We, we have like the measuring stuff, the... Uh, uh, who gave what to whom during offerings kind of a thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, what else do we have? Uh, we don't have... Well, we have all yeah, um, sorts of sort of palace records and um, sort of what sometimes people uh, dismissively refer to as receipts or, um, you know, economic documents or sometimes religious documents that may, mostly about things like, you know, how many goats were sent to so-and-so's temple and, and what... But it's also true that all of that evidence wasn't supposed to survive, right? It survived sort of, um, you know, it's a complex story, but basically by accident. And most of the Linear B evidence comes from a very thin slice of history, like maybe one year or two years, right? So we get this fantastically um, detailed or interesting, at least, uh, snapshot of one tiny moment in um, the history of some parts of what we what we now call Greece, Um but it's uh, it's tantalizing in its own right. So it's, you, do, you obviously have to be very careful to draw large conclusions about what society was like back then. But um, um, it, it, it's certainly enough to give us a sense of the differences between what whatever um, Homer is coming up with, it's a quote unquote Homer, uh, is coming up with and what these other documents is that tell us about, say, how, uh, you know, uh, Princely Oikos was organized or something like that. But goodness, I would like some love songs. I mean, during, uh, you know, during the same time frame, um, oh gosh, I'm pretty sure, I don't think I'm making this up, it's 1200-ish BC and earlier, the, the, love, the ancient Egyptian love songs that I was looking at, uh, you know, they, they were written down. Um, so 
would be nice to find some linear B at least love songs, if not epic, uh, you know, lying around someplace. So just so we can compare. I wonder the um. I I wonder if that would be possible. I mean, my 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 limited understanding is that you know this the the writing system was adopted and 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 really used for these administrative purposes. So I would have no um, immediate expectation of a finding survive further surviving uh much further surviving play in uh in that isn't from that exact time period um well actually i'm not so sure maybe i'll take that back but i i would be surprised if we found other genres of of text um and I'm it's just, extremely uh, sad on some level it is but here here's a a wonderful tale waiting to be told you know some um some Egyptians, let's say, who, who came to Greece during the Bronze Age and decided to write about it. And that writing mm -hmm. in ancient Egyptian script during that time was lying around. You know, that would be nice to find <laughs> in Greece or or yeah. or or, you know, um, just because we would know for sure it's about Greece, whereas if we're looking at mm -hmm. it in ancient Egyptian script were like, are we talking about Greece? Like, is that the land you just talked about? The people you're talking about or? I think it's a fundamentally important, at least hypothesis to maintain that like, okay, and then an, an Egyptian love poem from 12, you said 1200 BC or something. Um, what's to say that one of these poems or some of these poems aren't also, uh, you know, very similar to maybe the stories are similar to things that, yeah, people were, picking up in Greece or in some other part of Africa or in the, in the Middle East. Um, uh, what does it you know, what does it mean to really like label it Egyptian and say, oh, it's it's from Egypt. Okay, sure, it's from a language that's mainly attested in, in what we now nowadays call Egypt, fine. Um, but we also know perfectly well that that's not how the history of literature plays itself out and the history of myths plays itself out, right? Um, uh, so it, 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 I like that question in some ways because it, raise the question of what kind of evidence would would be convincing right would convincing evidence that um something maybe was inspired by something from another place or otherwise and there's a sort of i don't think there's a any a sort of set of hard and fast rules for for thinking through these things and it might just take some uh more open-minded poking around and guesswork and the sort of the freedom to be able to pursue sort of lines of question questioning that might not really lead anywhere first, but might um, change how we look at the sort of continuity of the literary traditions across um, you know, the region in, in, in those time periods. Well, okay, so let's assume for a, a moment here that these oral traditions of the fall of Troy were around oh, Troy. 1200 BC, okay? around mm -hmm. there and uh and a, a a little bit earlier maybe if uh if eric klein is right and many archaeologists are right that that there seem to be evidence of um different wars that were going on in that region and so these are stories that were told and retold about their war stories um and they're they're just different war stories that were eventually compiled some 400 years later, 500 years later. And um, if they're if they're compiled and people were, were putting this together, who are these people that cared to do that? Why did they care? Um, why did they think that was so important to write down uh, about the wars from 500 years ago? Uh, I mean, all, the, all those are questions, right? But who who are these people? Were these nobles that wanted that wanted to um, to hear about themselves, hear about their he, their heroic tales and their ancestors who fought in these? Uh, because the heroes are all like nobles. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's clearly the um, the target audience. Right. I mean, I think that that's something we can all uh, prob probably all agree on. But in terms of this sort of exercise in uh, in, in, in 
the I think the word you use was you know compilation, and I think that the that question doesn't need to be as uh, that the the sort of process of compilation doesn't necessarily need to be as opaque as it may seem, uh, and what I mean by that is that you know if we are imagining a world in which there are stories about Troy. Why, we seem to have evidence of that from that one line of Luvian verse, which is you know, tantalizing evidence as it may be, but we seem to have evidence of that. It seems reasonable to imagine there were other poems about Troy, right? I don't think that's a stretch. And at some point, someone or some group of people started to sort of collect their stories in a, from a specific angle, I think might be a way to look at it. And and then eventually those might have been compiled into something bigger, like closer to an epic and maybe something like the Iliad. Um, and if that's our rough trajectory of what's going on, you know, we do have evidence in a comparative context of similar processes, right? Not at all identical, but, you know, if you look a little bit eastward to the history of the uh, Gilgamesh text, which I mean, I've talked to you about that before, like the we do have a, a sort of rough stratigraphy of like the earliest unconnected uh, Sumerian tales in, in, in verse, seven or so poems. Um, we then have uh, 1,000 years of people writing and rewriting the epic of Gilgamesh and Akkadian, um, also in other languages, Akkad, uh, Ugaritic, uh, I think, and um, there's definitely translations into Hittite, uh, sort of uh, paraphrase adaptations into Hittite. So that we can see that people are making choices about, oh, I want this character included. I want this version of that story. Right? We, we do have one text in, in Sumerian that's actually the same story told in two very different ways. And so we can see the kinds of choices that get made when uh, the Akkadian scribe decided how they wanted to tell the story. Um, we see them tell the same story differently over a period of 100 years or a 1,000 years, right? And this isn't so different to... Again, very speculatively, what's what's going on in uh, India and in or in parts of India in in 1250 BCE with uh, the uh, arrival at somehow arriving at one version of what we call the Rig Veda, which is you know 1,028 hymns. Okay, it's not an epic, um, but how do you pick which 1,028? I'm not I'm not going to be convinced that there were only 1,028 and that is that they were all like, composed exactly at the same moment, but. There's probably a large tradition with many, many thousands of hymns. And uh, for some reason, over years, uh, these 1,028 came to be collected together and we happen to still have them, which is very convenient, um, but shouldn't uh, confuse us that there's a massive uh, gap in our knowledge of not just thousands of hymns in, in Vedic Sanskrit, but many uh, hundreds of thousands of other poems in other languages and from the region. So I think that, you know, you, there, there's space to sort of um, perform some of these exercises in the speculative reconstruction of literary history without um, pushing the bounds of plausibility too far. In fact, I find it useful more in terms of um, challenging what I take, what I consequently take to be sort of ridiculous hypotheses. Right. So if someone uh, says to me, "Oh, I'm, I'm you know, convinced." Um, uh, a man called Nestor in um, uh, Crete in the 6th century wrote the Homeric epics, both of them. I'm like, well, that seems unlikely because, you know, in, a, in, in all the sort of comparable traditions I know in the world in which these kinds of texts uh, come about, it's very rarely one person in one place, right? Um, so if you can sort of uh, accept the, the sort of value of the comparative work for negating what may seem sort of ridiculous hypotheses. You might also embrace the value of comparative work for opening up new ways of thinking about the evidence you do have. Um, if that makes sense, sort of it can go both ways. Oh yeah, I, I think what is different in um, uh, that was going on with the Iliad and the Odyssey and, and the Homeric hymns, and, um, but, but definitely, uh, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey is that there was a huge gap between the last time that anything was written down in um, Greek islands or Greece at all. The, you know, so there's that gap, uh, and so I think it's dur it's the gap there when people finally uh, were putting together a script 
that they were they decided on you know that they were deciding on that 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 this is what they decided to write down um and i i think that's why it's interesting interesting to me anyway like uh, of all the of all the writing that you could have written down um why the epic it was very important to a group of people who had the resources to gather scribes and so on right and those those would be the richer people and um that's why we're we're getting this i think it's because it's uh the the nobles were like okay well we're excited we have to, we finally can write this down all about how important we are here we go i, I like the thinking about the humans behind the the writings and the purpose of it and who funded them and who, who were it's about funding oftentimes right like um i mean scribes need paper and 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 ink um, mm -hmm. so some well, I mean, yeah, we don't, we don't have a great, we don't have great insight, right, into the Greek context for the production of text in of text like the like the like the Odyssey and the Iliad, um, for the what, first four or five centuries that we think that they existed, um. And I'm not a, you know, I'm not. I'm, I'm I'm relatively convinced that there were written archival, if we want to call them that, copies of uh, the Iliad and the uh, Odyssey by the time we get to um, Pindar, and then certainly Herodotus. Although, um, you know, Herodotus uh, has some. I think this is Andrew Andrew Ford made this argument a long time ago, but um, Herodotus has these moments where he says, "Well, I checked." The text of Homer and this word only appears once, and it turns out he's right, and that's interesting. So he must have had something to to look at, right? But then he also says things like, "Well, so this event happens in Book Five of the Iliad." You know, like, "Well, actually, it happens in Book Seven, according to our version. Maybe it's a different version. Maybe Herodotus just misremembered because he had to look at it and then go home and write his stuff." Um, so there's some open questions there, but um, I don't know if there was, a, you know, an intense amount of writing down of these texts much earlier than that. And it could have been that they were, um, that that wasn't even a concern uh, in, in, in the early parts of this, uh, of their history. Whereas we do know that, you know, for, uh, for instance, for again, for Gilgamesh, you know, that apart from the fact that the scribal schools had been around for a long time, um, but in, you know, there are these myths or, or stories that are told about, um, Various kings and Nashubanipal, for instance, like sending scribes out to the corners of the empire to collect texts and bring them to the center and recopy them out and make sure we have the right version of everything and, and that kind of thing. Um, and we don't have as many uh, narratives of that kind in, um, about Greece to sort of compare them to. But it does seem to be the case that producing, you know, massive textual corpora requires institutions. And so we're right to ask, you know, what kinds of institutions whether uh, patronage or schooling or, or whatever must have existed for, for this to be possible. Is there a lot of um, talk about singing about things and dancing about things in other texts in epics, uh, since I don't know other epics? From, from other parts of the world? Yeah, like the ones that you've read. Because I mean, I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, the you know the the hymns of the Rig Veda is just hard to summarize them because there's so many different different things going on. But a lot of them are about uh, making sure you perform the hymn correctly and sing it correctly and do the ritual correctly for so that the um, gods will give you what what you want in exchange for for your excellent performance. So there's a lot of. Um, discussion of, of correct performance and uh, both singing and, and ritual action. Um, i trying to think, and uh, is there much singing in Gilgamesh? I might not think it's really coming to mind right now, but I might be misremembering something. Certainly the, um, um, the, uh, it, one of the interesting features about Gilgamesh is that it, the late, latest, sort of um, recension, what we call the standard Babylonian version, because it's written in a standardized 
um, literary dialect um, does include the sort of instruction to the reader that they have, the reader should go and read the text. Of course, the reader is listening to the text or is being performed, presumably, but as a sort of method of authentication, it sort of says, well, if, to make sure you know you're getting the right version, you can go and check it um, as a sort of idea. Uh, and of course, you can't really go and check it, so you might ask some questions there as well. Um, but it is interesting that it conceives of itself as a written document um, very explicitly in, in that moment in a way that, for instance, uh, to my advice, the Odyssey and Iliad never quite do. And in fact, only very obliquely contain things that might be seen as, as writing. I'd even have to ask you uh, if you can remember where that is, because I, I haven't read carefully enough through all um, 24 books yet. Yeah. As, uh, you know, scanning it already made me slow down a lot. Um, I've scanned to, through book 20, 20 is done. Mm -hmm. um, and I slowed down sufficiently, but enough to a certain degree, but not enough to like really comb through it. Like I'm combing through book one right now. My gosh, I'm combing through it. Um, but one thing I did- is extremely, uh, extremely rich. So, you know, take your time with it. But um, the, the, the two of the instances I'm, I'm thinking of are, I can't remember where, but the story of, um, is it Iliad 6, Bellerophon, um, and uh, the thing told by Glaucus, um, where he has a sort of, um, as part of the story, there's a, there's a some kind of document that's supposed to tell someone else that he should be killed. Um, and it's unclear, you know, if that needs to be writing or if that could just be a symbol, for instance, or a... Um, some kind of token that expresses the meaning without it necessarily having to be, you know, a written letter. Um, because one might think of oh, sort of a ha gosh, Hamlet yeah. and the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, but, you know, yeah. it doesn't have to be quite that way. Okay, now I'm going um, to look at that, uh, the Bellerophon story. You're mm -hmm. right, it's that, it's that one. Uh, telling him, telling someone to kill, okay, to kill him. Um, yeah, and in, in the Odyssey, you know, um, a bit more of a stretch, but I think an exciting uh, thought experiment is more about Odysseus's scar as a kind of um, inscription on the body or writing that somehow announces a, a story, uh, but obviously not in a in in the sense of a, a written text in the way that we might we might think of that. Um, but still, sort of makes one think: okay, is, is there a sort of understanding of um, semiotics at, at play there that maybe suggests something about uh, written culture at the time or, or whatnot? Um, wow, that's really something to examine. Okay, well, here's another one. Uh, I was asking you if there were references about singing um, within the epics themselves, because I noticed that in the Iliad, here's again, it's it's um, relatively cursory, but as many times as it talks about offerings, it doesn't say that let's sing while we offer to the gods. It's let us give these things to the gods to appease them or let's just give these offerings. But it doesn't say let's hymn and offer to the gods, which is interesting. In, it, in the Iliad, you're in, saying? In the Iliad. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's, when there is dancing and singing going on, it's, um, it's in a sort of festive sort of way, like, uh, when it's referred to in the Odyssey, it's as there, as some, as a bard is singing, then there's, uh, dancers or, or acrobats with balls and, and they're stamping their feet and so on. Um, okay, so there's that. And then in the Shield of Achilles, there's three times they talk about singing or dancing or musical mm -hmm. instruments. Um, there's the, there's the wedding going on. There's the, the lioness song over there. But, but again, when I look around and try to find evidence of, um, hymnal songs, or offering to gods while singing, while playing an instrument, I don't see one. And it 
bothers me <laughs> because I, I really want to do, you know, as, as I, when I look at the Orphic hymns, I, you know, I've sung a few and Homeric hymns and I've sung mm-hmm. a few of those, I'm singing them. But I'm singing them thinking that they're supposed to be sung in offering to the gods. But it, in the Iliad, it's not there. Now, I haven't looked at the Odyssey yet for that specifically. But, but I, I don't remember any. But, you know, again, I haven't looked at it. But in the Iliad, I don't see it. And, it, you know, anyway, so that's, that's mm-hmm. one thing that's bugging me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't um... Like yeah, I, I, I off the top of my head, I can't remember if the um, uh, sort of the kinds of things that you get in hymns, where you know at the end it'll say something like, "Oh, and I'll sing you another hymn one day if yeah. I if I get what I need." Then yeah. like that in kind of thing hymns, doesn't quite clearly. It's it's yeah, you know. But in the Iliad, like yeah, in the Homeric mm-hmm. hymns, and here's a song I sang, and I'll sing you another thing, but. Um, you know, the only to think about this is in terms of the sort of um, I, I I don't know if there's a name for this. I call it the sort of modularity of of dactylic hexameter poetry, where you know you can even from a lot of hymns you could sort of take out the sort of introductory and and closing sort of sections and then just sort of end up with the with the narrative portion. And um, people have argued, for instance, that certain parts of um, even the Iliad one uh, come from what were were originally hymns, and that uh, you know they get transformed into narrative. And one way that that happens is by removing the the material that isn't uh, narrative, um, and that chunks of uh, dactylic hexameter poetry were moved around in those ways seems to be um, quite clear from the way certain things might have been inserted into the. Odyssey and Iliad, but also from uh, more specifically from the Hesiodic corpus, where you know diff- different texts are really just based on moving around certain portions and then expanding or or, or continuing on from them, and in, in, in maybe very different tones, right? And of course, some of these things are later, but I'm thinking of the taking the piece about uh, Andromache from the Catalogue of Women and using it at the beginning of the Hesiodic Shield. Is it Andromache? Maybe I'm misremembering. Um, but um, in any case, that that kind of thing where something is taken out of the catalog and then becomes the beginning of a narrative sequence is a very sort of rough transition. But um, who knows if like one reason we don't have those sort of ideas in the Iliad might be due to the one way in which hymns are incorporated into narrative is that those are the portions that might be um, removed, for instance. If that makes sense. Yeah, the whole still unsatisfying is the answer. It is. But... It, I mean, restructuring everything, of course. I mean, there's just always like sing this, muse. Okay, sing, sing this. Mm-hmm. But uh, when it t- comes to ritual, the the funeral hymns are coming from Nereids and um, and Thetis. You know, uh, they're they're singing. Um, but that that's an odyssey, uh, and it's there in the odyssey um, when they're recalling the death of Achilles. I I can't remember which uh, uh, Center for Hellenic Studies reading Greek tragedy online thing that was that I where I sang, and I want to say it's it's twenty four, but I I mm-hmm. gosh I could be wrong. Joel, don't kill me. Um, yeah, okay. But anyways, it's the Nereids and, and Thetis are, are singing during, um, for, for Achilles' death. So that's a ritual thing, and they're singing going on. Um, they're not singing to the gods, though, since they are mm-hmm. gods. They are singing. These are gods singing. <laughs> right? These are gods singing for themselves about the death of a mortal uh again again i'm looking for ritual singing in the iliad and the odyssey of of humans like human singing ritual mm-hmm. songs to gods and yeah it, yeah right well i mean i i don't know i don't have any nothing uh is coming to mind but also you know the iliad much better than i do but um 
you know, there are moments in the in in the Odyssey of of Lament that I think are also similarly not 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 directed at the at the gods, and that's sort of interesting. They're more about uh, maybe even healing the the community. Uh, I think of uh, Odysseus's men crying over other men who've been killed along the journey. Um, the um, uh, in, twelve enslaved women who Telemachus will eventually murder are brought into the halls, and they're crying, and and they're all huddled together in a way that uh, reminds one of the um, funerary lament for Patroclus in the Iliad. Um, so that kind of thing, but but people are really using uh, lament, lament song, or um, the crying is a kind of uh, in more <laughs> imminent mortal level uh, way, yeah, and not sort of directing it uh, to the gods. Yeah, human grief being expressed for humans, but not in prayer mm -hmm. to the gods. Anyway, so this is something that I'll be looking at um, along with... T t God, by now I have this long list of like, wow, this is something to look at. Mm -hmm. And that's another one. And that's, that's another one. It's like musical instruments and singing to gods is one. And then it's like animals, um, animals. And just like, I, I saw this list of animals, like from 1898, you know, uh, just animals being listed right. down. And, um, and that to me is fun because because the subsequent um, uh, research after that is like animals for offerings or animals for this or animals for that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but just like a simple list to start off with is, um, is just really something. And I, I actually want to compare it to the list that I, that I ended up having, um, you know, if, if it's any better, uh, using TLG or looking looking at everything now than it was so many years ago. That's its own study, by the way. Like looking at the research, it's very meta. Looking at the research from those many years ago and comparing it to now, like are we any better? Mm -hmm. You know what? What kind? Like did they sit there and they counted it out uh, like I did and and write it down write down everything using that method versus TLG mm -hmm. method is that fast? Is that really more accurate? Better? Um... I think it changes. You know, the the technology changes the questions you can ask, and um, certainly facilitates certain kinds of research enormously. But um, you know, I do find myself uh, sort of switching between older forms of of research and more. Um, recent technological ones a lot. Um, I think that also really depends on, on the field. And I think classics is, is in some ways blessed with like an enormous infrastructure of uh, digital humanities resources, um, obviously still being worked on, still being improved, still growing as they should. Um, but it's really striking that in other fields that these things just don't exist yet. Um, and some of them are sort of starting to happen, but very slowly. And it really does make, um, kinds of questions you can ask are very different um, if you have to, you know, manually go through uh, hundreds of texts to find things that that, that are uh, relevant to your, the questions you're asking, or if you can use some of the tools that, that classes have. Um, but, but I do find it interesting that, you know, for, uh, you know, one of the theories we have of, of how Homeric poetics works, especially, is that things like formulas and epithets are significant, not just because they um, modify whatever they're attached to, but because perhaps they are supposed to remind us of previous times that those words and formulas were used and sort of create kind of hyperlinks, or if you will, in the text between different portions of, of poems and maybe even across texts and other texts that we, we have or don't have. Um, and that, in that capacity, I think the way that we approach looking at the text through our computers is actually quite interesting um, because it replicates some of these patterns. And I think more should be said about how this might actually be teaching us to understand 
how poetry makes meaning in different ways than we normally expect it to, especially because we're, it's very tempting with an extremely narrative corpus like the Homeric epics to to read linearly, sort of vertically, and just go through this, you know, the scrolls. Or, um, but that's not the only way that you know poems create meaning. We know that poems go back and forth with sound associations and things like that. And uh, if the technology is somehow teaching us to read better in those ways, then maybe that's a cool thing too. Are you familiar with um, Brady Kiesling's The Topaz Text? Topaz Text. Sorry, yes, I misheard you. Yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, isn't it just like the best thing ever? I, mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it when um, I think it's Alicia Stallings, oh. the first, um, yeah. Stallings that first told me about Brady's work. And I was like, what? Oh my gosh, more people should know about this. And um, it's so I important to know. Uh, where something is when they're describing it so that you can feel yourself more immersed in it and also understand more. When I look at the place where Poseidon's, Poseidon's um, uh, palace is supposed to be and it's like, really? It's, a, it's there in that, in that, okay, all right. It's, uh, it's under, it's near those <laughs> islands. Huh, how interesting. Um, and those, you know, those islands, I can see them now in my mind. It's like, it's, it's near Anatolia and it's like, it's, it's further north than I would think and much more east and, um, and why, you know, and so you start asking like, is that, it's like, that's the, the, a boundary place and a place that, um, where lots of, I guess, pirates really are. So it's like, that associated with treasure? Is that a place where treasures are you associated with that? Do you, you know what I mean? Like, why there? Why would they locate his palace there? We assume it's it's tradition of some sort, but what if it's not? What if it's came later? You know, it's an archaic tradition because by that time we're used to treasure coming in and out of these places, these particular straits or um, yeah, and I mean, I, you know, even if it, you know, one exercise is obviously trying to work out the uh, ancient geographical area on whatever text you're looking at. Um, but it is a sort of it's one of the things I found most fascinating also visiting uh, Greece and, and, and reading text alongside my trips and stuff is thinking like, okay, well, how do people try to give meaning to places, right? And there's some identifications that obviously, for instance, make absolutely no real sense, um, but just sort of, you know, maybe speak to what people wanted something to be or what they wanted to have close to them or what they wanted to have around them. And that's just really fascinating to me. Um, I'm now, I'm blanking on his name, but there's a, a sort of minor Greek hero in the Iliad uh, who gets some... Um, to whom they, uh, some archaeologists assigned like the minor shrine on the lower plateau of Sunion near the uh, temple of uh, Athena. Um, and they say, oh, this is the, the, the shrine of that Homeric hero. And of course, there's no evidence at all that anyone in antiquity would have made this connection. And it's uh, the archaeologist decided that this must be the case. But um, a lot of times these things do happen also in antiquity. And it's a sort of recurring game that people play where you know like uh philosophers of uh, uh, philosophers has something about like oh you know if you're ever going by the the shores of uh, Mytilene on Lesbos make sure you check in on the tomb of Achilles and that it's nice and orderly and you can fix it if it's if it's in ruins you know and it's like well okay you know maybe I'll I'll go look for it this summer but I doubt I'll find it there um um yeah and I'm always, I'm always reminded also of this uh quote from Moby Dick where um, Ish uh, Ishmael asks Queequeg, where, you know, where are you from? And he says, well, blah, 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 blah. And, um, but like all real places, it's not on a map, um, which I think is a sort of great way to think of um, the problem of like correlating literary topographies to real topographies, that there's a sort of game being played here where trying to construct a competing reality to the one that actually exists. Um, and you get little tantalizing things like that in in Homer as well, in some instances where, uh, you know, for instance, the uh, uh, Scaria, the island of the Phaeacians is blocked off 
for ever being found again, right? By Poseidon and or Zeus. Um, uh, well, Zeus and Poseidon uh, have an argument about it, and then that happens. And uh, in the Iliad, we hear that you know we can't see, we can't go back to the um, wooden walls that the Achaeans built around their camp, which was which were apparently these wonderful walls, right? Um, the most beautiful wooden walls ever. And then, unfortunately, they're gone. So if you go to the shores of Troy, you're just not going to see them. Uh, and of course, right now, you know, there's this boring ideological answer someone could give by saying like, well, yeah, because they weren't there. So they had to put in the poem that you can't go see them because if you did check, then you would know the poem was a bunch of crap. But I don't think that's really what's what's going on here, that it's just about proving, you know, one reality over another, but a sort of, um, there's some kind of like desire there to to have the thing be there that can't possibly be there or something like that. Well, gosh, I'm looking at the time. I can't believe we've been talking for two hours. Yes, it's been two hours, Claudio. And you were you? you were concerned. You were like, oh, I don't know if there's going to be enough material. I go, oh, no, there's going to be enough. And you're like, yeah. And, uh, you know, we'll try to make it interesting. I go, I know it's going to be interesting. I know it's going to be interesting because I was going to talk to you. And you're, I mean, you're, you're so knowledgeable. And, uh, you know, I've been wanting to do this interview with you for, for quite a bit. So thank you so much for being here now. Um, any, um, I don't want to put the pressure of like any last minute words, but you know, any, any thoughts we, we started off by saying, you know, that we're talking about the sea and, uh, we're, I mean, this whole, this whole interview has really been about your specialty, which is comparative lit. And it's been absolutely wonderful. And I hope you don't mind coming back now that, you know, you, you know what this is like and where it goes. Um, I have 23 more books to go. So <laughs> I'll be like, hey, what do you think of this book, uh, uh, Claudia? You know, um, so you know. But any anything that uh, you want to say for just for this for now, anything remaining that you want to say? Um, I get the last word. Yes. Um, you know, I'll just say that I mean, you know, I I this this uh, conversation has made me think a lot more about something that I, I I'm always saying that I, I should think more about, but I don't think enough about, which is. Um, what it must have been like to sort of um, arrive, you know, what are the institutions that could possibly have resulted in um, the texts as we have them? Um, and that, and like, I mean, I'm thinking that that's something that I want to definitely get back to and I think would be uh, a really interesting topic maybe for another conversation about sort of whether we think those are, we know we have some suspicions they might be political, some suspicions they might be religious, but like that's that's not very detailed. You know, we can probably come up with something better. Well, thanks again so much, Claudia. Now, when you when I say goodbye to you, it's just goodbye to everybody. But uh, you know, just stay on. So, bye for now, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>